career in Potomac City, Maryland, at the home of Harry R. Healthnet, a 95-year-old who is a pioneer and visionary in the healthcare industry. I've come to talk to Harry and discuss with him some of his innovations in dealing with people in the healthcare industry and some of his methods of rewarding them. On the way to his front porch I couldn't help noticing a large sign in his backyard with the words, reasonable and customary. As the morning went on he later explained the reason for the big sign. As he led me into his living room and we took a seat, I noticed Harry teetering a little but in very good shape for his age. Well Harry, I understand you're a veteran. That's right Rex, got into every war I could love to fight. If there's any killing to be done, I want to be the one doing it. Couldn't ever get enough of it. Sounds exciting Harry. So, how many people did you kill in all the wars you were in? Well, none, actually. It was kind of boring. I was a typist the whole time. Cool, well, typing was a needed skill, I'm sure. You managed to stay in pretty good shape, I notice. Sure did, he said with a smile, and this is partly how I've managed to do that. He reached into a cooler beside his chair and handed me a cold can of beer. I popped the top on the can of beer and took a sip. Ah, that hits the spot. Nothing like a cold beer on a warm day. So, Harry, what do you think of this affordable care act? He looked at me with a twisted grin and shook his head. You have to be kidding me. Sure, it looks good, cool idea. Abema is an okay guy and trying to do the right thing, but you know Rex there are too many crooks in the system. Trust not want not. I took another sip of the beer, A. Eh? how do you mean? He chuckled a little. Okay, so you see the doctor or go to a hospital with your new affordable care insurance and you think everything is hunky freaking dory, right? I nod. Then lo and behold you get bills from the hospital and doctor after your insurance has paid and find out that bloodsuckers want more money. That's how it really works. But hell, you don't even need to see a doctor or hospital. I have a lot of bills here they send me without me even seeing them, the useless tricks. Well Harry, some of them must be okay, they can't all be bad. He looked at me over the top of his glasses and nodded. You're right, there are some good ones, but you have to keep them so scared they would never dream of trying to be crooked like the other slimy bastards. You know Harry, that beer is going right through me. Can I use your bathroom? Of course. First door on your right. In fact, at the risk of making us look like a couple girls, I think I'll just go with you, I have had a few beers myself. With this I wasn't real sure I wanted to use the bathroom, but hesitantly followed him down the hall. When we took the right turn that he'd mentioned I was quite surprised to see an open door that led to his backyard. Outside the door I could see the big sign that said reasonable and customary. And there was a huge, very deep hole in the ground about 10 feet wide and 20 feet long and a bulldozer at one end of the hole. Harry looked at me as we stepped outside the door. I'm not real big on indoor plumbing as you can see. Go ahead Rex, make yourself comfortable, let her rip, take a good whiz. In fact, take a dump if you feel the need. I felt a little startled and took half a step back. Well, actually, I can hold it. I'm good for a while, but thanks. I took another look at the big sign on the other side of the hole and heard some noise coming from the hole. I took a couple steps closer to the hole and looked. Hey Harry, there's somebody down there, and they seem to be complaining about something. I leaned over a bit and took a better look. There were a dozen or so people at the bottom of the hole. It looked like there was money all over the bottom of the hole, and a bucket of chicken down there too. So, how did they get down there, and what are they complaining about? Harry shrugged. Oh, they're complaining about several things, really. First off, it's fake money, which is why they went down there, to get that money they thought was real. The bucket of chicken appears to be a nice gesture, but it's just full of bones. And they're also bitching, because their cell phones, don't work real good down there. Then when all those little bricks, got down there I pulled the ladder up, being the efficient kind of guy I am. Harry begins to urinate into the hole, then throws in a few shovels full of dirt. Hey, you bastards, how's that? Does that help your phones work a little better? You dumb bastards, serves you right for being so stupid. Never seen such a bunch of idiots, the way they're so addicted to those damn phones. I'm standing there with my mouth open in disbelief. 
Harry, who are those people? Harry scooped up some dog crap off his lawn and was throwing it in on the poor fools and threw in a couple more shovels full of dirt. Well, they're not people anymore, pretty much never were people. These are some of the bad ones, some of the baddies I set a trap for, and they took the bait. They're nobodies, really, just some stupid asses that used to be doctors at the hospital, some drug company executives and insurance people, just really dumb bastards that try to screw people. They're disgusting little pricks who don't know what reasonable and customary means, but they're learning now, aren't you? How you doing down there, you stinking crooked sons of bitches, you useless cocksuckers and whores? I stood there frozen, with my mouth open, not knowing what to say or do, seeing how Harry was enjoying it all so much. He teetered for a bit, took a step back and looked at me. I could fill the hole in with dirt, but that would be too good for them. Better to let them rot and stink for a while, let them enjoy being down there, simmering in the stench of it all. Today we're in Podunk City, Maryland, for the second time at the home of Harry R. Healthnut, a 95-year-old who has been a pioneer and visionary in the healthcare industry. Click here to learn about our first visit and interview with Harry. Our mission during this second visit is to determine if it's true that Harry has really died. As I come up the rickety steps to his house I have his obituary in my hand and stop when seeing a coffin on the porch with old Harry lying in it and a lovely tool in his dead hand. To the side of the coffin was a large box with a big pile of cell phones in it and a sign saying, leave your cell phone here no cell phones allowed. To the side of the porch there was a large sign with an arrow pointing to the backyard that reads, the money is back here. I almost jumped out of my skin and nearly had a heart attack when I turned and saw a live version of Harry standing just inside the slightly open door, looking at me with white eyes and holding a finger to his lips. As the screen door slowly opened he motioned me in and told me to be quiet. I nearly freaked out when looking at Harry, then back at the coffin on the porch as he and I proceeded into his living room. Harry, what's going on here? Who is that in the coffin on the porch? He made a face at me with a frown as we took a seat in the living room. It's a dummy, you numbskull. What do you think it is? You thought it was me, didn't you, you damn fool? Pretty convincing, eh? I'll say convincing. You got me on that one. Where did you get a dummy like that? It looks exactly like you, can't tell the difference. Made it myself, Rex. I took wood shop a long time ago, and did pretty damn good at it, as you can see when you look at that dummy. You'll never see anything that good in a Macy's department store window. The tulip is real. Picked it from my garden. You notice nobody else sent me any flowers. Those useless tricks. Yeah, that's a shame, but nice tulip. Okay, Harry, so what gives? I have your obituary right here. Says you died a few days ago, yet here you sit right in front of me with a perfect look like dummy in that box out there. It would strongly appear to almost anyone that you have faked your death. What's going on? Harry looks at me with a grin. That's exactly what I did. But you're the only one who knows, and let's keep it that way. As far as everyone else is concerned, that's me in that box out there. I wanted to see what kind of lice and vermin would crawl out of the woodwork to try to get my stuff if people thought I was dead. And there's only one way to find that out. So I'm feeling a little dizzy and have to take a deep breath or two. So, what happened? Well, they fell for it, quite literally, like a bunch of loud bound bastards they are. You remember my toilet from the last time you were here? Oh, right, your 10 by 20 foot and 15 foot deep hole in your backyard, because you are not much into indoor plumbing, right? Right. When they see the dummy in the coffin and the sign at the side of the house, pointing to the money, they run right back there to see what they can steal, and they fall right into that big hole. I cringed. Sad to be the one to say it, Harry, but it looks like you have proved your theory about human nature. So, many if not all of your friends and family are in that big hole back there, wallowing in a bunch of muck and whatnot. But I really don't want to dwell on that ugly image. So what's with a box of cell phones on the porch? Good question, Rex. You know I hate those things. They should be banned from God's green earth, terrible and monstrous damn things. I squinted at him and scratched my head. But everybody has one these days. 
I was glad I had thought ahead and turned my phone off before coming up to the house. God gave people ten fingers to type with, and those idiots use one or two thumbs to type with really gets on my nerves. It's like somebody with two perfectly good legs bouncing around on their head like a pogo stick or something. Pisses me off, and I'll be damned if I'm going to look into that hole out there and see people waiting around in their own squiller. Okay, a lot of it my own, and typing with their damn thumbs. It's not going to happen on my watch. I slowly shake my head while gazing from the window at the big hole in the backyard. You know, Harry, they seem kind of quiet down there, considering their predicament. Well, truth is they can only endure the sting for so long until finally passing out, with some of them falling face first into it, poor greedy bastards. I suppose I should read your book, what is it, checklist for something or other? I sigh. Checklist for staying healthy. Right, but I notice I kind of got taken on my copy of your book. You know, I paid about 15 bucks on Amazon and now you have it in that Kindle thing for 99 cents. He gazed at me suspiciously from the corner of his eyes. I shrugged and looked out the window. Then again, that Kindle thing has its limitations. Let's say you're out in the woods, need some toilet paper, and all you have is your Kindle thing. Kind of difficult to tear some pages out of it, right, Rex? I nod with my eyes closed. So, I'm probably better off with a paper copy with pages that can be used for other things when needed, right? The stench from the hole outside was starting to drift in through the window. I decided it was time to get going and got up. Well, Harry, whatever makes you happy, I guess that's the important thing. I took a last look at the dummy and the tulip in the coffin on my way down the rickety porch stairs. Today we're in Podunk City, Maryland, for the third time at the home of Harry R. Healthnut, a 95-year-old who has been a pioneer and visionary in the healthcare industry. Click here to see our first interview with Harry, and here to see the second interview. I'm careful on the way up the rickety steps to his porch that seemed to be in a state of disrepair, with a door flopping around when I stepped on it. At the top of the steps Harry meets me with a firm handshake and a steady gaze out onto the neighborhood. Glad you could make it Rex. Good to see you. He motions to some chairs on his porch and we take a seat. We may as well sit out here, nice of as it is, if that's okay with you. I nodded and sat down. Sure, this is good. Sorry about those stairs. Meant to fix them but been busy lately. We can thank the Lord S. down the street for that. A while back he decided to come over here, and those steps are about as far as he got when some of them gave out. So he gave up and never came back. Some of his friends were wandering around in the dark, went into my backyard and fell into the toilet. You know, the 10 by 20 foot hole I've got back there. Had to use a crane to pull the fat bastards out of there. Well, yes, Harry, I do remember your outdoor plumbing situation. How is it back there today, anybody in the toilet? He shrugged. No, quiet day today. Nobody has managed to fall into the hole, not yet anyway, but the day is young. We'll see. So Harry, I understand you're quite a health advocate. You work out at the gym and whatnot. Yeah, mostly whatnot. The gym, well the gym is okay, but nothing you haven't seen before. Seen most of those people already in skin movies. Nothing new, really. I go to the one that Jack Lorraine got going way back in the day. He lived to be 96. Big deal, Bob Hope lived to be 100 and never exercised. You didn't see Bob Hope doing push-ups all the time like some fanatic and bossing people around. So, I guess laughing is more important than exercise, right Rex? So, how many skin movies have you seen? All of them, every damned one of them. You need to know what people are doing when they think you're not looking. Wow, that's a lot of movies. I know you're really out there. How's your love life? No complaints, Rex. Pretty dang good, really. Of course I'm no Hefner, not doing quite that good. He's just a kid, compared to me. He's 88 and married to a 28-year-old. 
Only 60 year age difference. Well, I guess that's not so bad. I got my problems, Rex, but tell me something. How the hell does a guy explain to his wife's parents how it happens that he is so much older than the grandparents? I don't touch anything younger than 30. And like I told you before, I work out, take care of myself and stay in pretty damn good shape, actually. I was doing Jenny Craig almost every day, in fact, for a while, that is until her family started complaining. And I said, what the hell, do you care, she's in a coma. Oh well, sometimes you just have to move on. But the girls at the gym, well, they keep me happy. Harry's head lifted and he gazed into the distance. The fat neighbor was waddling down the street toward Harry's house. Harry shook his head. No you don't. Turn back right now, Lord S. I'll call the fire department. They'll be here with a fire hose before you even get here. I looked at Harry and down at the broken porch steps. He's coming over here? He's got a lot of nerve. Well, he thought he was. Hey, Lord S., the fat farm is the other way. Make a left on Temple Street and stop at the TV station. They got a program you can be on and make some money. Lord S. is on parade kind of program or something like that. You'll fit right into it. They call it Fat Festival or something. I looked at Harry and down the street at the fat guy. Fat Festival? Really? That sounds interesting. Harry nodded. Yeah, some TV program. They get paid a few bucks to beat each other with hoses or some kind of weird nonsense like that. Has nothing to do with weight loss, of course. We all know the weight loss is mostly diet, and so does the TV network, but the stupid fat fools don't know that. They think they will lose weight by beating each other with hoses. The dumbasses are so stupid. Good he has you for a neighbor. I'm sure you'll guide him in the right direction. Harry frowned and squinted at me from the corners of his eyes. I looked at him. You're quite a pioneer and visionary in the fitness stuff, from what I understand. Hell yeah, been there, done that, Rex. You remember that Neil Gibbons guy, don't you, from back in the 70s? In fact, I think you mentioned him in your book, Checklist for Something or Other. I nodded. Yeah, Checklist for Staying Healthy. That's the one. Harry scratched his head. Hell yeah, I taught old Neil everything he knew. No man is an island. He could have been somebody with everything I taught him. He was doing good for a while, then like a dumbass he went off by himself into the woods and started doing all kinds of stupid things, like eating tree bark and stuff. Between you and I, well, I think he had some mental issues. The silly little prick thought he was a beaver or something, and died like a fool, freezing his ass off in the wilderness. I stood up for a minute, yawned and stretched my legs. Well, nothing's perfect, I guess. We all have to go sometime. His cell phone rings. I don't have to take this, but I'm in a good mood. Yes, this is Harry. No, stupid, I wasn't born in 95. I am 95 years old. He turned the phone off. Numbskulls. Harry, I thought you didn't like cell phones. No, I think they're great. I just don't want everybody else to have them. I use the internet too, but does that mean everybody should be on there messing everything up for the really cool people like us? Hell no. The cell phones and the internet should be reserved for the vanguard elite, people like you and me, people who know how to type with all ten fingers and not just their thumbs. Harry picked up his phone and was making a call. The fat guy was thundering down the street toward us. The sound of the siren was in the distance and quickly came closer. As the fat guy got a few yards from the house a fire truck stopped in front of the house with a burst of water from the fire hose, drenching the fat one. The fat guy was rolling in the street like a helpless baby whale flipping and flopping like a giant fat fish out of water. Harry closed his eyes, slowly shaking his head. Look at that rich retarded fool flopping around like that. Some people never learn. So why was he coming over here? I scratched my head. He shrugged and made a face. Probably my own fault. I was getting bored and wanted some entertainment. So I put a sign up a few days ago that said, Free Buffet, with an arrow pointing to the backyard. They came trotting over here, like a bunch of baby elephants, right into the backyard, where they mistakenly thought there was a bunch of food, and fell into my giant toilet, the dumbasses. But that one didn't seem to be able to read. 
He sees all his fat friends coming, makes a wrong turn, starts up the steps and made a mess. Good thing he didn't make it into the house. He would have fallen right through the floor. Like a fat zombie, he probably still has some weird idea that there is some food back there and thought he would give it a second try. It can get downright baffling. You think you know somebody, you get used to seeing them every day, and one day they're just gone. He's a nice looking upbeat sort of guy, like a lot of people who do the 5 o'clock news, jokes around with his co-workers, does his job, pretty normal dude. Then he up and drops off the face of the earth. So where did he go? You think about making a missing person report, look under the freeways for him, then realize those spots are pretty much for the homeless veterans, and keep searching. Just about when you're ready to give up you almost faint when you see him sitting there, in a coffee shop, reading something and looking almost normal. You step inside take a seat near him and just stare, with your mouth open. He looks up from his coffee and sees your look of surprise. He smiles at you and says, 7 to 4 shift, and goes back to his reading. You move a little closer and look at him with your hands up, in wonder. How did this happen? Did you grope the wrong person at the office, or what? He shrugs and looks around to see if anyone is listening before turning to you. It happens. You gawk at him with wide eyes and mouth. It happens. How did it happen? Who did you piss off? Did you make fun of somebody's retarded child, get caught making out with a weather girl in the parking lot, or what? You get another shrug and the beginning of a smile from him but nothing else. You look around the place and at him. This is what it's come to? I have big hopes for you. You seem to be doing okay. Four to seven shift? You've got to be kidding. He shrugs again but doesn't look up. You scratch your head and wonder. You know, I would expect this from one of the more aesthetically challenged people on the TV news or even the prima donna movie star wannabe weather girl who takes an average of three days a week off, but you, it just doesn't make sense. He nods with a sigh without looking at you. You slowly shake your head. This is disastrous. Nobody is even up that time of day. It would be bad enough if you were doing the news in the middle of the day when the only people watching are the dangerously drugged people in the rest homes, but 4 to 7 in the morning? That's ridiculous. He glances at you briefly with a poker face. I know, it's horrible, like getting displaced to Mars. Then I have to figure out what to do with the rest of my day, getting cut to just three hours a day. But it's not like I'm the only one. Good lord, I'll say horrible. You heave a heavy sigh. What could you possibly have done? It's not like you're old, pasty looking and ready for the pasture like some of the others. And I can envision a little or even a lot of pretty much innocent crap ass going on around that place with you probably being one of the main perpetrators but 4 to 7 in the morning? Are you kidding me? He quietly shakes his head. You squirm a little. You know, that's the time of day when vampires are just about done drinking blood for the night, burping a lot, and about ready to hit the sack before the sun comes up. The criminals are just ending their nights, filled with all sorts of despicable crime, and about ready to collapse into some sort of drugged out coma. What the hell do you do? Just sit there, in front of the camera, twiddle your thumbs and pit your nose, for the three hours before walking out, to that empty parking lot. He nods without looking up. Yeah, that's pretty much it, I guess. By the way, who are you? Once again we're in Podunk City, Maryland, for the fourth time, at the home of Harry R. Healthnut, a 95-year-old who has been a pioneer and visionary in the healthcare industry. Click here to see our first interview with Harry, here to see the second interview and here to see the third. As I approach his house, I walk up the steps and find Harry doing push-ups on his porch and counting. 98, 99, 100. A pretty young girl with a low-cut top and wearing an apron was inside the screen door and looking at me. She squinted with a frown towards Harry and was shaking her head and holding up four fingers. Harry didn't see her. Wow, never gets any easier, Rex. Just have a seat right there. Harry points to a chair while catching his breath, gets up and takes a seat in another chair. He noticed me looking at the girl in the apron who was going back inside. 
Oh, that's Cindy. She does a little cooking for me and helps me around the place. A little licky and lossy sometimes, but she's a pretty good kid. No hugs or anything, though, if that's what you're thinking. Strictly plutonic number she is. I see the steps have been fixed, Harry. I feel so much safer coming up them. Nice job. Takes a lot to keep the place up, but I do my best. Have to keep things in working order. Kind of like your book, checklist for something or other, right? Well, maybe you should call it Stairway to Good Health. I nodded. Checklist for staying healthy, right? I noticed something odd, sitting on a little end table that rested between his chair and mine, and leaned toward it to take a closer look. What's that? It's all shriveled up. Oh, yeah, well, there was some buzz around town about the world's oldest apple, or something. People were talking about it, and I said, hey, I think I may just have that. So they all come over to see it. Must be 50 years old. I looked at it again. Wow, it is an apple, but you would hardly guess that. Pretty ancient. Right. So all these people are standing around, you know, typing with their thumbs and looking at the apple, and some kid says, where's the mouse? Kids are so dumb these days. What the hell does an apple have to do with a mouse? Mice don't eat apples, at least one that's that old. Good God, not even vaguely related. I shook my head. Yeah, people can be strange sometimes. There was some noise and ruckus, coming from what sounded like the backyard, like somebody screaming. Harry glanced at me from the corner of his eyes, and pointed to the side of the house. You were so preoccupied with the steps, that you missed that. He was pointing to a big sign at the side of the house that said, 60% off on recreational prosthetics. I stepped off the porch, for a minute and took a closer look. You know, I have a hunch this has something to do with your outdoor plumbing. Sure does. When they see the sign they get all excited, run through the gate, hit that greased walkway back there, and slide right down into the latrine. You know, the 10 by 20 foot one I have back there, that's 15 feet deep. Must be, maybe half a dozen of them down there. I nod. Yes, I'm beginning to get the picture, but I'm a little at a loss as to exactly what are recreational prosthetics. More noise was coming from the backyard, from somebody who sounded like they were under doors. Nice puppet show, Grandpa, you insane old fool. Hey, you old bastard, let us out of here. We didn't sign up for this. I glanced at the sign again. So, I guess you have had a pretty good laugh at their expense, but you're going to let them out pretty soon, I would think. Harry shrugged. No rush. Well, Harry, some people might be a little concerned about the legalities regarding all of this, you know. Nobody forced them to run back there like a bunch of idiots. They did it to themselves. Besides, they got some free entertainment. I gave them a puppet show a while back. Kind of into puppets, you know. The girl with the apron was behind the screen door again. She had a puppet on each hand. She stood silent, briefly looked at Harry with a frown, while slowly shaking her head, before going back inside. Okay, so, as I understand it, there are actually no prosthetics for sale, at any price, right? Just a giant toilet, or rather a big nasty and stinky hole, for them to fall into when they go back there with a lot of excitement, and expecting to get some new parts. Yeah, that's pretty much it, Rex. It's, well, let's just say, it's the law of retribution catching up with them, in a way. They're losers, and that's why they are down there. They're down there, helpless and hopeless, typing like crazy, with just their thumbs, as idiots do, wishing and hoping one of them had a cell phone that was waterproof. You have to let them out, Harry. You'll get in trouble. It's for their own good, Rex. You know, there are a lot of disturbing things in this world, floods, fires, disasters of all kinds, but some of the things that get on my nerves the most are fake body parts, just for the entertainment purpose of being better than somebody else. Sure, I can understand somebody having a nose job, new lips, a whole face with even, but people walking around like their stuff doesn't stink with their brand new, inflated fake ass, well they just really get on my nerves. You're right, Harry, there are a lot of disturbing things in this world, and I'm afraid you're one of them. That's how people are, many of them, anyway, always wanting to make improvements. We have to be tolerant, you know. Do we? It teaches them character, discipline and humility. 
It helps them think more positive and appreciate what they have. You know, some people in this world don't even have toilets.